Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. You can join our Telegram group where all the lecture related information is available. We also have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures are available and a master integration key which coordinates between Google Drive and the YouTube link. These are the disclaimers. And we are with phase three, which is recorded pathology lecture. And today we have something very special. We have dermatopathology pursue 26U. And the topic of the day is something very interesting, benign melanocytic lesions of the skin. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Anand Bardia. He is an MD from PGI Chandigarh. Presently he's a consultant at the Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, with areas of interest in oncopathology, dermatopathology and cytopathology. He's got multiple publications in international and national journals. He's also worked as a senior resident in the, in the Department of Pathology at PGI AMER Chandigarh. With this, I would request Dr. Anand Bardia to start his lecture on benign melanocytic lesions of the skin. Over to you, Dr. Anand. Thank you so much. So very good day to all the viewers. And uh, today, first, I would like to thank the Percy team for giving me this opportunity to discuss the topic of benign melanistic lesions of the skin. So before we start, first I want to start with a disclaimer that uh, this presentation is purely for educational activity and there's no commercial interest involved. So with this, let's start with first with the basics of human skin anatomy. So we all know that human skin comprises of five layers. From the top, it is a stratum corneum followed by the granular layer the spongiosa layer, uh, the basal layer, and then there's basal, basement membrane which separates it from the dermis, and then it's a supplement tissue. So, where is our cell of interest located in the skin? It's basically in the basal layer in the normal human skin. As we can see in this microphotograph, this as noted by this arrow, this is this one cell which is showing some perinuclear halo with dark hypochromatic nucleus. So, and it's lying in the basal layer. So this is a melanocyte. So what are melanocytes? Basically these are solid dendritic cells which are derived from the neuriferous cells. They can be seen in the basal layers of the skin, hair follicles, then most squamous colored mucous membranes, in the leptomeninges and also in other cells. And as we can see in the photomicrograph that the, these melanocytes they're usually liquidated singly in the basal layer. So, uh, usually it has been seen that a normal nanocyte to basal granulocyte ratio is 1 is to 10. And when we have some difficulties, we can identify them through special stains like the fountain of mesin silver stain. Then we have bleaching agents which actually bleach the melanin pigment like the hydrogen peroxide and potassium permanganate. And we have immunostains like S100, melanin mark one HMB45, which are quite specific for melanocytes. So in my residency periods, we always used to know, learn that melanocytes produce melanin. So one question used to linger in my mind. If melanocytes produce melanin, so is it that all the melanocytes are pigmented? And secondly, on microscopy, when I see any pigmented cell, are those all melanocytes? Well, it's, well, we don't see, we, well, the answer is no to both the questions. Actually, all the pigmented cells which we see in the skin may not be a melanocyte and all the melanocytes may not be pigmented. So what are those pigmented cells which we see in the human skin? Well, it can be a keratinocyte, it can be a melanocyte or it can be a melanophage. So how to differentiate them on microscopy? Well, it's easy to differentiate them. We know certain features of each of these cells. Keratinocytes, as we will see in subsequent slides, are polygonal shape and they're usually arranged in a honeycomb pattern. They're not arranged singly. And they have, sometimes they can show a perinuclear clearing, like a naked nucleus floating in the empty, in the empty space. Because it's because of the presence of glycogen vacuoles. Whereas melanocytes, they're usually round or fusiform in shape, and they are singly scattered in the basal cells. They have, also they have a grayish cytoplasm connected to the nucleus. Whereas melanophages, they're usually seen in the dermal papillae, 
and the cytoplasm is laden with the melanin pigment. This we can illustrate it further with this photomicrograph. Now in the first photomicrograph you can see that there's some, there, is, there's, there are many pigmented cells in the basal layer. So are, so are these all melanocytes? No. If you look closely, then these are polygonal, if you see these cells, these are polygonal cells and they are in basically in contiguity with each other and they don't have any such, a, they are polygon shape, they are not round open. Whereas, and if you see in the upper dermis, some of these cells, they have a naked nuclei which is floating in the empty space. And what happens is, the cyto or the cratocytes, they are bound to each other by desmosomes. So the cytoplasm cannot, cannot shrink. So the nucleus appears empty. In contrast, if we see the melanocytes, since they are not bound to each other, but to the neighboring cells by the smosomes. So they will have a grayish cytoplasm which is connected to the nucleus as we can see in this photomicrograph. And they are usually round to oval in shape and they usually occur singly. So it's not so hard actually to distinguish a melanocyte from a keratinocyte. Whereas melanophages, as we can see in this photomicrograph, they are usually heavily pigmented with melanin such that their nuclear features are almost obscured by this pigmentation and they're usually found in the dermal papillae and not in the epidermis. A melanocyte, have, after learning about the various morphological features of melanocyte and their anatomy, let's talk about the physiology of melanocytes. We all know that melanocytes, they produce melanin. But what is the function of this melanin? What is the function of melanocyte per se in the human skin? Melanocytes are usually actually dendritic cells. The name because of their the name is so because they have dendritic processes by which they are connected to various keratinocytes through which they transport their melanin pigment in melanosomes in vacuum in melanosomes and the keratocytes then actually eat up these dendritic processes containing the melanosomes and transfer it to their cytoplasm and this melanin then protects the, the keratinocytes from the damaging ultraviolet rays of the sun and melanin is usually produced from the is produced from tyrosine amino acid with the help of the enzyme tyrosinase so is it so then having learned about this physiology one question quickly props up so is it so all the dark blue skin people is it that their skin is having more, more number of melanocytes or is it something else actually it is the rate of pigmentation of the, in the of the melanocytes which differs in various races and due to which we get different skin color and tones having learned about the physiology let's discuss about the pathophysiology of the pigmented skin lesions now keratinocytes and melanocytes actually if we see they are together they form an epidermal melanin unit and it is the interaction between these two kinds of cells which is actually responsible for the synthesis transfer transport and the position of melanosomes in the skin and if there's any disturbance in this proliferation system they it will result in disorders of pigmentation if this proliferation if there's disturbance if there's a proliferative disturbance in the melanocyte in the cell we get melanocytic lesions but sometimes pigmented lesions can also occur due to other causes it can be due to some cutaneous lesions which are not malignant like seborrheic keratosis, acnonic keratosis, Bowen's disease, papillomatosis, or it can be due to some malignancies like a basal cell carcinoma or schwannoma, or squamous cell carcinoma, or dermatofibrosarcoma and so on. So whenever we are dealing with melanistic lesions, they have to first decide whether it is a primary melanistic lesion or it is due to something, some other lesion. So melanocytes and melanocytic lesions now coming to the main crux of this session today melanocytic lesions can be broadly classified into benign and malignant lesions the benign lesions are known as the melanocytic nevi and the corresponding cells are known as nevus cells whereas the malignant lesions are known as usually called the malignant melanomas and the cells are known as the melanoma cells so with this Initially, we discussed how to differentiate between a pigment based types of pigmented cells in a normal human skin the melanocyte, the keratinocyte, and the melanophages. Now, we introduced two, two more terms apart from melanocyte, 
an universal and a melanoma cell. So how we can differentiate between these three kinds of cells? Melanocytes, as I already said, they occur singly in the basal layer of the epidermis. They do not, their nuclei are small and regular and the mitosis is rare. Whereas nevus cells, in contrast, they are arranged in clusters, although their nuclei are small and regular like those of melanocytes and mitosis is rare. But these cells, they occur in clusters. Whereas melanoma cells, as they are malignant, they show more of atypia and enlarged nuclei. They can occur in clusters and sheets and they will show frequent mitosis and their nuclear is nuclear enlargement, their nuclei are irregular and hyperchromatic. So now coming to the benign melanocytic lesions. Now the benign melanocytic lesions can be broadly classified into four categories. Lesions with basal melanocyte proliferation, melanocytic nevi, dermal melanocytic lesions, and atypical melanocytic lesions and the malignant melanocytic lesions. Now coming to the first category, that's the lesions with basal melanocytic proliferation. If you see, these are few names like lenticus. These include lenticus simplex, multiple lentigens, labial and genital melanotic macules, solar lentigo, lentigous nevus, speckle lentigous nevus, puva lentigo, and scar lentigo. In this uh, presentation, we'll be discussing the three major types which are often encountered in day to day practice the lentigo simplex, solar lentigo and puva lentigo. If you, if you put a, a pay attention, you see all these basal melanocytic proliferation, they usually are coming with the term lentigo. So what does a lentigo mean? Basically lentigous means this increase in basal and basal melanocytic proliferation, that is the epidermal melanocytes. But unlike maybe, they do not occur in clusters. And the two major types are lentigo simplex and solar lentigo. In the lenticus simplex, as you can see on the left hand side, clinically they occur as macular pigmentations which are sharply circumscribed. And on microscopy, if you see, there is a little bit of slight to moderate elongation of the red ridges and this increase in the number of melanocytes, especially at the tips and at the sides. But these in this increase in the melanocyte is never contiguous to that of the other rhetoric. So this is an important point to differentiate it from the malignant lesions. Whereas in solar lentica, as we can see, there's more prominent elongation of the rhetoric such that they assume a club shaped or a tortuous bulbous shaped appearance and they can often show budding appearance. And they are heavily pigmented at the tips and the sides but again over here we see that there is no contiguity between the melanocyte sides of the two retiriges and moreover one more point to notice all these pigmented heavily pigmented cells in this lesion are not all are not melanocytes but actually many of them are basal platinocytes which have been infused with many pigments due to increased melanin proliferation and puva lentigo, sometimes we can see in patients who have been treated with soron and ultraviolet A radiation, and especially in the sun protected sites that are, such as the Botox, we can see an increase in the number of melanocytes. But with these melanocytes, they, are, they have a little bit of enlarged nuclei and can show mild atypia. But nonetheless, these should not be confused with mel a malignant melanoma. Having discussed about the basal melanocytic proliferation, where we just see an increase in the number of epidermal melanocytes, now we come to the actual benign melanocytic nevi, where there is actually a clonal proliferation of the nevus cells. And this is basically a mixed bag, where the nevi have been classified according to the level of skin where they are found. Like if they are found at the dermopidension, it is termed as a junction nevus. If it if it is at the only confined to dermis, it's an intradermal nevus. If it is involving both the dermoepidermal junction and the dermis, it is known as a compound nevus. Then we have some nevus, nevi, which are having special characteristics. 
and so they have been named accordingly like the deep penetrating nevus or the balloon cell nevus or the halo nevus and so on then we have a special category of spitz nevus apart from this we have pigmented spindles and nevus and the congenital nevus so let us discuss them one by one so junction nevus if we see clinically they appear as a lentigo they are sharp circumscribed macular lesions macular hyperpigmentations and they can occur at any age and can occur anywhere on the body surface and with time these junction nevus actually mature into compound nevus and then ultimately to the to an intradermal nevus so this is a junctional and in this micro photograph we can see there's proliferation of melanocytes but this is usually it is limited to the dermoepidermal junction and these melanocytes they occur in clusters and if we see there's a symmetry maintained in the lesion if we give a closer look we couldn't see any atp in these cells there will be no mitosis would not be would be rare if it occurs so these features indicate that it's a benign lesion and the characteristic present location of these cells make it a junctional nevus compound nevus on the other hand has a more elevated appearance and is usually seen in children and adolescents and they appear more tan or dark brown in color and as the name suggests it's a compound nevus having both the junctional component and the intradermal component but the symmetry of the lesions will be maintained and they also show maturation because they are quite extensive lesions so they will show maturation from top to bottom in the top in the upper dermis the papillary dermis we see round epithelial melanocytes as we go down these melanocytes become smaller in size resembling a lymphocyte and as we go further down these can appear fusiform shape or a neuroid shape which are usually which can which are sometimes called as type c melanocytes melanocytic or nevus cells this is a photomicrograph which shows as you can see this proliferation of the melanocytes and it is involving showing both the junctional activity and if you go further it will be an intradermal component also if we see at the low power we can see that the symmetry will be maintained and these lesions if we can see if we, in the top in the first second photomicrograph you can see these lesions these melanocytes they are round epithelial in shape as you go further down they become lymphocyte like and then as we go further down as we can see over here they have a, they appear they assume a spindle shaped form coming to intradermal nevus whereas these nevus clinically they appear as moons so they can protrude from the surface and they are sometimes called as papillomatous nevus as the name says the nevus cells they are confined to the dermis so we do not find any junctional activity in these lesions and these cells demonstrate maturation with depth on microscopy we see these uh, we see the proliferation of the melanocytes as nevus cells and they are arranged in nests or cords and the deeper part they may show neuroid differentiation so as we can see in this photomicrograph we see a proliferating lesion which is confined to the dermis there is no junctional activity and it is going deeper into the involving the subcutaneous tissue also and we can see the melanocytes they are arranged in clusters in nests or they can be in cords and if we see deeper down they are assuming a neuroid or spindled appearance coming to another category that is the deep penetrating nevus also known as plexiform spindle cell nevus so these nevus they are usually compound type and so these nevus they are usually compound type of nevus and they are usually regarded as a part of congenital nevus now on microscopy these nevus they have a characteristic v-shaped appearance with the tip pointed towards the dermis so these need to be differentiated from the nodular melanoma and how to differentiate them let's see on the microscope so on this look if we see what we can see is a v-shaped lesion is there and it's we can see they are they are scattered pigmented cells throughout the lesion if we go on a higher power we can see that these are actually melanocytes which are arranged in clusters and in nests 
and they have both junctional activity as well as the dermal component. So if we get this blue cells or the melanocytes with a wish-shaped appearance of the lesion having shown junctional activity and some they will they might appear or uh, uh, they show a spindle cell appearance in the dermis usually in the upper dermis we should think of a plexiform spindle cell nevus the next is the special category that is a balloon cellulis as the name suggests balloon cellulis will show presence of ballooning of the cells where the cells get enlarged and they have abundant clear cytoplasm and if it is more than 50 percent they are termed as balloon cellulis so balloon cells are not specific for a balloon cellulis only if they are more than 50 percent they are given a special term that is balloon cellulis so these balloon cellulis if we see why they are why there is clear cytoplasm it's is it due to lipid no there is no glycogen, there is no acetonitric nucleotidosaccharides. So all these things would be negative in the balloon cells. So what is the reason for the clear, clear cell appearance? It is because these balloon cells, they show they are actually of, there is actually, these are formed actually to progressive enlargement of the melanosomes in these melanocytes. And ultimately this is called by destruction of the melanosomes. So they have an empty appearance and these balloon nevus, cell nevus has to be differentiated from other tumors which show clear cell morphology. The most prominent among them is the clear cell hydratinoma. And even when, you, when we have come to the diagnosis that it can be a balloon cell elastic lesion, there is a variant which is known as a balloon cell melanoma. So we have to give a closer look if there is any ATP or not, if we can, if you find nuclear ATP with mitosis, it can be a balloon cell malign melanoma. This is a photomagraph of a balloon cell malign melanoma which I have put for comparison. Coming to other part, halonevus, also known as Jupiter acquisitive centrifugum. Now halonevus has been given the term halonevus based on its clinical feature. These nevus they are characteristic Please show they can actually show a, melan a melanocytic ring around the melanocytic nevus, and clinically they have to be differentiated from a Meyerson's nevus, which also shows a halo, but that is an eczematous halo. And these halo nevus, they also have a characteristic morphological feature. If we can see that there is a dermal proliferation of the nevus cells, but they are heavily infiltrated by chronic inflammatory infiltrate, which can be lymphocytes or plasma cells. But as we can see, there are pigmented cells also in between. So if you see scattered pigmented cells along with lymphoplasmistic infiltrate, one should think of a halonevus. The next one in the discussion is a persistent melanocytic nevus or a recurrent melanocytic nevus. Well, as the name suggests, these nevus, they occur in recurrence to some prior lesion. Basically, nevus, this is really seen nevus which have been inadequately excised. So what happens is there happens to be a scar formation and on that scar, that nevus grows again. But when this nevus, retin nevus grows, it acquires certain other features which are not seen in the primary nevus. So what are those features? Clinically, we can see a scar tissue on which there is a nevus growing in which there will be macular hyperpigmentation but on microscopy what we see is there will be presence of lentiginous and junctional peaks above the dermal scar so in the dermis we can see the fibroblast proliferation but on the top of the that the epidermis will show the presence of nevus cells and these melanocytes they are usually they are more reactive for HMP45 in recurrent lesions than the original ones so over here we can see that over the dermal scar there is over the scar there is a growth of a nevus of tab macula which is a regular black macula and on microscopy as we can see the dermis shows fibrosis with some inflammation and the epidermis shows proliferation of the nevus cells so coming to the next broad category that is a spitz nevus 
Now a split sleeveless. These are having a. These are usually occur solid. These usually occur as solitary lesions, but sometimes they can be multiple lesions, and they have and they are usually seen in children and young adults. Usually they are seen on lower extremities and face, and they appear as dome-shaped, hairless, small pink macules, and small pink nodules, as we can see in this picture. On histology, the Spitz neighbors, most of them are of compound type, but predominantly they have a intradermal component. So, what is so characteristic for the Spitz neighbors? Well, the Spitz neighbors show a composed of spindle cells or epithelioid cells. And if they show junctional activity, the, we can see a clefting between the proliferating melanocytic nevi and the overlying epidermis. They can, they can have several variants like the atypical spitz nevus or a hollow spitz nevus if there is lymphoplasma cytic infiltrate. It can be a desmoplastic spitz nevus where we can see the stromal desmoplasia and some atypia, a plexiform spitz nevus where, spitz nevus where they can see spindle shaped lesions or it, uh, if they start showing atypia with nuclear enlargement and increased mitosis, it can be a malignant spitz tumor. So how to differentiate? Now this photomicrograph, as you can see, in the first, this is a low power. We can see there's a symmetrical lesion, which is with proliferation of the melanocytic nevi, showing both junctional as well as intradermal component. Now, when we look at these melanocytes, if you see, they have a typical enlarged nuclei with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, prominent nuclei and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, as we can see over here. But in spite of this angry looking, they do not show any vegetoid spread and there is very little pleomorphism. Apart from this, they have one more characteristic feature which is often seen is they have deep eosinophilic cytoplasm and sometimes they can show multinucleation and they show often show these eosinophilic globules which are known as chemino bodies. These do not, these usually do not, and on empty stain, they appear a little slightly bluish and bluish green color. So, these are the communal bodies. So, what are the criteria for spitz nevus? Well, there are some major criteria and there are some minor criteria. The major criteria include the symmetry of the lesion should be maintained, the cell type is it an epithelioid or a spindle shaped lesion with maturation of cells, absence of vegetoid spread to differentiate from malignant lesions and presence of communal bodies. There are minor, minor criteria like the junctional cleavage, superficial multinucleate nevus cells, perivascular inflammation, but absence of nuclear pleomorphism, atypical mitosis, pitch spread, superficial uh, and uh, low mitotic activity. So, if, so what are the features we should look for to differentiate a benign spitz nevus from a malignant spitz nevus? Well, these are some of the features. They are malignant spitz nevus usually should have a diameter of more than one centimeter. They have the show potential ulceration with lymph node metastasis. There's absence of vertical maturation from type A to type C cells. They have a fascicular cell growth pattern with cellular disc cohesion. And they show moderate nuclear pleomorphism with mitotic activity in the deeper dermis. They can extend into the subcutis and they have pushing margins. With this we come to another category that is the reed sleevers or the pigmented spindle sleevers. Well, they are cell, they are well circumscribed lesions. They are, appear more like a papule, usually of in females, young females, and in carries. And if we see this, the name suggests they are pigmented with symmetrical. There's a symmetrical lesion which shows proliferation of nevus cells and having both junctional activity as well as intradermal activity, but it is usually limited to the upper dermis. And we can see spindle shaped cells, cells in between the derm in the upper dermis. At this we come to our next, uh, this is congenital nevi. Well, congenital nevi, they usually found in newborns and infants. 
usually on the scalp or in the lower extremities and they are solitary lesions. They are well some of them have tried to clasp them according to the size like smaller is less than 1.5 cm, medium 5 to 20 and larger ones as more than 20 cm. But usually these lesions are less than 10 cm in diameter. Well, the junctional layer, the congenital nevus can be junctional compound and retermal type. And the very characteristic feature of congenital neva is they tend to extend around the nerves, blood vessels and at next cell. And the, and the melanoma, and even if they transform into melanoma, it usually shows a very less aggressive throat pattern. So if you see on the clinically, they appear as a pigmented or macular hyperpigmented lesion with a mammillated surface. And if you see on the microscopy, we see there's a symmetrical lesion which is showing, showing both junctional and terminal component. And if we have a more look at these lesions, they will show maturation from top to bottom, like type A to type C melanocytes. And if we have a look, these uh, these nevi they show they usually have a tendency to extend around the nerves and the adnexal structures and it trickle in between the collagen fibers also. Like this is a this is a erector pili muscle, and we can see the melanocytes trying to extend around it as well as a little bit into it, into the rectal pallid muscle. But these are not melanomas and these, this is the character feature and sometimes they will also show some nixoid degeneration also. So when all these features are present with, with the appropriate clinical setting, then it's actually a congenital neva and we have to differentiate it from a melanoma. So after I've completed the melanocytic nevi coming to the dermal melanocytic lesions. Well, dermal melanocytic lesions usually arise due to arrest of migration of the neural crest cells to the epidermis. So, when the neural crest cells, when the melanocytes from developing from the neural crest cells, they are, their progression or migration is arrested in the dermis, they proliferate in the dermis and give rise to a lesion. And these are known as dermal melanocytic proliferations. Well, they have characteristic names depending on the way they occur and at what age they occur. Like the Mongolian spot, nevus of Ota, Aito, Hori, Dermal melanistic Hamatoma, Phacomatosis, Pigmental Vascular Spetacus in the eye, Cutaneous Neuroprostic Hamatoma, Blue nevus, or Blue nevus like Metastatic Melanoma, and Malignant Blue nevus. So, we'll discuss some of these lesions. First is your melanocytic hamartoma. So as the name says, these are basic congenital lesions which occur in early childhood. Usually they affect the females in the Asian population, but sometimes these can be familial as we see in Mongolian spots. They can appear as diffuse blue or blue gray macular patches, and on microscopy they show diffuse dermal proliferation of the pigmented dendritic cells. And they can involve deep soft tissue and bone. They have an excellent prognosis except if they undergo malignant transformation. And some of the some of them can be so can associate with other melanomas also, like nevus of Ota is associated with the meningeal melanocytoma, and 25% of these cases undergo malignant transformation. So Mongolian spot, well, these appear as blue-gray patches. Usually uh, they disappear as the child grows and uh, usually they are located in the sacrococcygeal region or in the scalp or in the temples and microscopically we usually see these scattered melanin containing melanocytes which are oriented horizontally in the deeper part of the reticular dermis with few melanophages so this is a clinical picture of a melanocytic region we can see the sacrococcygeal region blue gray patches and microscopy will see the melanocytes in the dermis. So this is a typical Mongolian spot. Coming to the nevus of Ota or nevus of Aito, well these are dermal melanocytic proliferation which appears blue dark brown or macular area of pigmentation and whereas the nevus of Ota is termed where it affects the ophthalmic and the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve 
Yes, I2 occurs in the supraclavicular lesion and the deltoid lesion. And microscopically, these occur as nodular diffuse collections of melanocytes, which are scattered in the upper parts of the reticular dermis. In contrast to mongolian spot, these hyperpigmentations do not disappear. So this is a clinical picture of a nevus of Ota. We can see this blue-gray patch, which is seen around the periorbital area and the conjunctiva. So this is one microphotograph of nevus of Ota cells. We can see this deeply pigmented melanocytes, which are present in the deeper dermis. Now coming to blue nevi. Well, blue nevi, they occur in the mucus in the smoothly in the skin and rarely in the mucous membranes. There are three common types. One is the compound lemurs, other is the cellular lemurs, and the third one is the combined lemurs. In addition, sometimes these blue nevi can undergo malignant transformation where it is known as a malignant blue nevi. So coming to the first variant that is a common blue nevus. Well, clinically they appear as a single well circumscribed lesion as a blue black papule. Now sometimes the portion and usually they are less than one second diameter. Now the sometimes you must be wondering why we see it blue nevus because it appears blue, but melanin is actually brownish in color. So why it appears blue? Since these lesions are located deeper in the dermis, in the deep dermis, so because of the tintal effect, these actually when these pigment melanin pigments are viewed from the skin, they appear blue in color, and hence the name. So what we get in the microscope. So this is a clinical picture of a blue-black papule, which is characteristic of a lipocaxial blue-black papule, less than one centimeter in diameter, and is a blue nevus. So in microscopy, they have, if you see on low power, you'll see that there is some prominence of dermal collagen, and in between you can see some pigmented spindle cells, which are actually the melanocytic nevus cells. So is, this is the characteristic of the blue nevus. They are usually, again, if you see, these are actually a little bit of a deep dermal lesions showing more of a sclerotic background. And in between, we can see the pigmented nevus cells in between these dermal collagen. And this is a characteristic of the common blue nevus. Well, this common blue nevus, if it shows some dysmoplasia, small dysmoplasia, or a little bit of less hyperpigmentation or, or a melanotic blue nevus. Sometimes can be compound. Usually they do not show junctional activity, but sometimes they can show. And there's another winter of hypercellular blue nevus, and sometimes they can show it mild atypia. Some people tend to call it a blue nevus with atypia. Coming to the next part, that is a cellular blue nevus. As the name says, over here, although there will be some sclerotic background, but compared to blue, it would be less and there will be more cellular proliferation. We tend to see more of melanocytes. It usually occurs between the ages of 10 to 40 in the buttocks, lower back and scalp. Usually they are 1 to 2 cm in diameter. And on histopathology, if you see, they are very pigmented. They are heavily pigmented cellular tumors. We can see cellular islands along with some loosely aggregated spindle cells or epithelioid cells. And Melanophages with abundant melanin can be seen, but this is usually seen in between the islands or at the periphery. And these lesions they usually extend into the subcutis. They are not associated with any overlying MC2 melanoma. And mitosis is less than 2, two mitosis per small millimeter. Again, they can also have some variants depending on what type of cell is present, whether it is spindle, sepia shaped, or it is epithelioid. But it can be alveolar type or a monophasic type or a permelanotic or cellular blue nevus or an atypical cellular blue nevus. So if you see this is a microphotograph. On low power we can see a wish shaped lesion which is very cellular if you see and uh, there's some pigmented cells at the periphery and if you see they have a dumbbell appearance at the at their margins. So when you will get this dumbbell appearance of wet shaped lesion with some pigmented cells, the first the, uh, the first thing you should come and remind us of cellular blue nevus. And they're very close DD, they have a very close DD is a 
pigmented dermatophyte or sarcoma. So how to differentiate between these two? It's simple that this, if we see the presence of this dumbbell shaped lesions and, and if we see this epithelioid nature of cells and if they trickle in between the dermatophyte groma, in between the dermal collagen, then these are characteristic features of a cellular dehumidus and this is how we can differentiate it from dermatophyte or sarcoma on microscopy. Of course, we can stain with HMB45 melanin, which will further confirm our melanocytic nature of these lesions. So histological indicators. So what are the indicators by which we should be looked for in a blue nevus to detect a malign transformation? If there's dense cellularity with clonal architecture like large round cells and increased nuclear tpia, increased mitosis, necrosis, presence of lymphatic infiltrate, it sh uh, sh these are indicators of a malign transformation. But when cavity is there, vascular intervention, perineural invasion can be seen in both types of lesions. And it is usually seen in many benign nevi also. So with this, we come to an end of this session. And uh, these are my references. And uh, I will we'll talk about the malignant lesions and the dysplastic lesions in our next session. Thank you.